First of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers for hosting uh, this conference and for inviting me and giving me this opportunity uh, to talk. So, um, in this talk, I'm going to review uh, recent progress in 3D gravity and its cousins, hi uh, higher spin theories. And at this stage, already at making a choice in the title, I failed at something very fundamental. <laughs> So one thing that the title is not uh, reflecting upon is who's the main character in this talk. Uh, and so I should explain a, a bit. So the main character for today is going to be black holes. And I think in this audience, I don't need to explain why black holes are interesting and why they're important in our understanding of quantum gravity. But what I do want to do is try to revisit and kind of open a discussion on how we uh, define black holes and what are the basic characteristics and features that we expect of black holes. So on my way here uh, to India, I had a long flight and a lot of time to waste on the airplane. And so I decided to watch a movie. And in that movie, the conception of a black hole, the idea that we had uh, was this one. So if you haven't seen Interstellar, this is, this is the image that you would get of a black hole. Rather elegant, beautiful, but for the purposes of today, not very useful. But I've heard that it's actually very accurate in terms of simulations and stuff. Now, in this audience, we have relativists. So when I said the word black hole, most likely the image that you got in your mind, the, the idea that you conceived was a Penrose diagram. If I say black hole, you will think immediately of a Penrose diagram with some specific uh, causal structure. And in this case, uh, I'm interested in eternal black holes, so they will be characterized in this uh, definition by a future, a past horizon, and having uh, two boundaries. However, um, it's been 100 years since general relativity was conceived, and in those 100 years, we come to realize that not every gravitational theory that we can design and study has a good uh, metric interpretation. It has a good geometrical interpretation. So there's the kind of gravitational theories that I'm going to discuss today don't allow for this uh, very nice and elegant uh, description in terms of Penrose diagrams. And you kind of have to reinvent the wheel all over again and, and rethink about how we conceive and characterize uh, black holes. In the scenarios, if you lack a geometric description, you might question two very robust and universal features of gravity. You might wonder what happens to them. So this has already been discussed throughout the conference, like, and it's been exploited tremendously, the close and intimate relationship between gravity and thermodynamics, and the intimate relationship between gravity and entanglement entropy, as was reviewed this morning by Rob. So in this talk, I want to tell you what is the recent progress that we've made in order to understand the relationship between gravity and entanglement in the context of uh, gravitational theories that don't have a metric-like interpretation. And the main object that we're going to use in order to understand this relationship and build uh, this new dictionary and this new characterization of black holes are going to be uh, Wilson line uh, operators. Now, before I continue, uh, I should tell you as well who has had the pleasure or disgrace of following me in this path. So uh, this talk is basically based on three uh, publications that are, uh, uh, are the main results that I'll overview. And I'll also discuss some work in progress. Now, I think it's always good to highlight uh, who are the most junior people in this collaboration so you can hire them in the future. So uh, Eva Yabres and Fotis are PhD students at Amsterdam. And here, Elliot Ijano is a PhD student at UCLA. And then we have uh, Nabil Ipgal and Juan Jotar, our outstanding postdocs. Nabil is at Amsterdam, and Juan Jotar is at ETH in Zurich. So OK, without further ado, uh, what I'll go through in the remaining time is basically uh, I'll div I divided the talk in four sections. Um, these are basically very concrete and precise results that I'll discuss. Uh, but I also, towards the end, if there's a point at which you want to strongly agree 
or disagree with me, uh, pay attention to when I get to this section over here. So I'm going to be perhaps a little bit controversial, but I'm doing this on purpose because I want to see how this wonderful audience react. So stay tuned, don't fall asleep, and let's move on. Okay, so first item in our agenda, uh, gravity and its relationship to Trin Simon's uh, theory. Now, this is an old story, uh, but it's a very good one. So let me tell it again. In two plus one dimensions, we have a luxury that we can describe general relativity in two different ways. So I can describe general relativity in terms of a metric, I use curvatures, and, and, and the action principle, the dynamics, is going to be governed by the einstein hilbert term. This is a way that I can cast a theory. Another way that you can cast a theory is in terms of flat connections, where the action principle is basically a Trin Simons term. So I have this freedom. I can choose either of these two descriptions to discuss general relativity. Now, each of these descriptions has its features and it has its failures. So the metric-like formulation is very much a par with a higher dimensional point of view that we have. And so it makes a lot of emphasis uh, on the metric. That, that's the main part. Space-time is very explicit. There are local variables. Uh, the advantage of the Trin-Simons formulation is that it makes very explicit the topological nature of 2 plus 1 uh, general relativity. So it's, it's reminding you at every step of the way that there's no local degrees of freedom. Now, another advantage in the Trin-Simons formulation, and one that I like a lot, is that it's very easy, it's rather immediate, how to generalize the theory to include massless higher spin excitations. And this is a feature that has been exploited quite a lot. Now, if you do include massless higher spin excitations, you will lose this type of description. So the luxury of having a metric and a gauge theory type formulation is very special to just having general relativity. And once I decide to generalize the theory, I'm going to lose that other description. So within this class, these are, these are, this will be a class of gravitational theories that don't have a natural metric-like interpretation. So if I hand you now a Trin-Simons theory, let's say I give you the action, it's equations of motions or flatness conditions, and the, the obvious question that you would ask is like, okay, so how do I interpret this theory as a gravitational theory? How do I describe the gravitational uh, degrees of freedom? So there's two important inputs that you have to say from the start. They're very basic. So the first thing that you have to do is make a choice of a gauge group, okay? So you'll tell me which favorite gauge group you're going to consider. Uh, what's very convenient sometimes is to split it into two. And in this case, I'm also going to be interested in gravitational theories with a negative cosmological constant. So uh, provided that you pick uh, some gauge group, uh, then I will ask you to identify the SO2,2 subgroup that it's inside there. And then this is going to tell you how you organize your massless modes with respect uh, to this graviton that sits inside that gauge group. So from this point of view, the fact that you have SO2,2 as a subgroup is why I'm calling this theory gravitational. Now, the second thing that is very important, and it's the one that is not natural from the gauge theory point of view, is to Im impose a certain set of boundary conditions. So, and here's where all the flavor, all the dynamics uh, will come in. So if I want to give this an, a gravitational interpretation, and in particular, make connections with ADS-CFT, uh, basically you will impose a boundary condition that you will only look at solutions or you will quantify your space of solutions in a way that uh, the difference with respect to some uh, background connection, ADS, is of order one. So there's a bit more into this uh, refining how you define boundary conditions, but basically this is something that you have to specify as you start studying the theories and giving them a gravitational interpretation. Okay. Now, once you have that in, in, in hand, you will ask, okay, what are the basic observables in the theory? How do I quantify and classify the solutions inside this theory? So very quickly, this is a long story. It's a very beautiful one uh, that dates um, back from the 90s or even before 
So the, it's a very similar statement as goes in the gravitational theory for the case where the gauge group is SL2 times SL2. So in the Trans-Simons language, if you start with this gauge group and a suitable set of boundary conditions, you will see that your classical phase space will be organized in two copies of the Rasoro uh, algebra. Now, if you change the gauge group, you will change the appropriate um, asymptotic symmetry group that organizes your states. And for instance, the one that was discussed yesterday by Matthias and was mentioned briefly in the previous talk is the case where you have this W infinity algebra, which comes roughly from an HS lambda uh, gauge group. Now, in all of these examples, uh, the basic feature is that the theories have a non-trivial central charge, which in terms of the Chern-Simons coupling is six times uh, its level. Okay, so that's one set of observables that you can discuss. Another set of observables are related to constructing non-perturbative solutions, constructing solitons. So provided you have some manifold, and you tell me something about the topology of the manifold, you tell me which cycles the manifold has and which cycles are contractible and which ones are not, uh, you can search for flat connections that are compatible with that, with that manifold. So for instance, uh, in Euclidean signature, what's very natural to do in order to find the solutions is to impose a, a smoothness condition on the connection along those contractible cycles. So if you impose that you have a trivial holonomy along what you will call a thermal cycle, meaning that when you go back to Lorentzian signature, this will be the time direction. If a connection satisfies this condition, we call that connection a Euclidean black hole. So this is our, our working definition of how you define and identify Euclidean black holes in this theory. Uh, along the same lines, you can also impose that the holonomy is trivial along a spatial cycle. And from this point of view, what you will find is something that we poorly denote as conical defect, but they're actually smooth uh, regular solutions in, uh, in these theories. And for instance, global ADS will fall, or uh, thermal ADS will fall into this category. So this is how we would define uh, Euclidean solutions in this, in this context, okay, by imposing holonomy conditions along appropriate contractible cycles. Now, there's other observables as well that you can design and that you can study, and they've been studied in the literature, but I don't have the time uh, to go through all of them, but please, if you're interested, eh, ask me later. So to summarize a bit what eh, we're going to use, so, uh, we're studying um, theories that have a Trans-Simons formulation. It's very clear, I hope, I just told you how to identify an organized finite charge configuration, so that's something that is very well understood. It's clear how to construct Euclidean black holes in these theories. There's a very vast and interesting literature on this subject that is worth so studying, and we know very well how to quantify its thermodynamic properties. And I should be very, um, I should emphasize quite a bit that this, all of these uh, features, all of this advance and all of this understanding never required and never involved a notion of the metric. So we are capable of, of quantifying all the properties of the theories with never making any attribute to a metric-like formulation, okay? So with that, let's move to the next set of observables. Okay, so I want to keep on characterizing this theory and its properties. This morning, we learn about another interesting uh, observable in, in ADS-CFT, which is entanglement entropy. And uh, Rob nicely reviewed its relationship to minimal areas and how there's been many checks and how it's been a very useful way to think about uh, gravity and, and our path forward in understanding what quantum gravity is. However, you can predict what I'm going to complain about, right? So I'm going to complain that in this context, I don't have geodesic distances. I have no idea what that is a priori. So what is this prescription? How would I compute entanglement entropy in this gravitational theories in ADS, this higher spin-like theories? Uh, how would I compute entanglement entropy of their dual CFT um, th theories? So the question that we need, needed to address is what is a geodesic in a theory without a metric? 
Well, we thought about it. The answer uh, is after thinking about it, the answer is not too surprising. And the right way, the way we wanted to think about this problem is just in terms of the connection. And the, the right uh, analogy was to say, well, the geodesic distance is basically describing the dynamics of a massive probe. Can you design massive probes in Trans-Simons theory? What will be the analogous of a massive uh, probe? Well, the, the quantity that contains that information is a Wilson loop operator. So the Wilson loop depends on two things. It depends on the representation of the gauge group, and it depends on the topology of the loop that you decide uh, to evaluate this along. So here I wrote it in two ways. So usually uh, the the basic definition of the Wilson loop is that it's a trace over this representation of the path order exponential of A along uh, the curve. You can also as well equivalently think of this trace in terms of a path integral. So this trace over R, if you think of it as the Hilbert space for some quantum mechanical system, uh, here I basically introduce a probe that lives on that Hilbert space, and instead of computing a trace over its Hilbert space, I decide to do a path integral over all possible configurations. Where A here is the evolution operator along this uh, curve. Now the representation will encode the information about uh, the quantum numbers of the probe. It will tell me how massive the particle is. Depending on, on which representation I use, uh, it will tell me what features this field has. And it will dictate what dynamics I put here in this uh, effective action. Uh, for our purposes, we want the mass of the particle to be a tunable parameter. And so the discussion involves infinite dimensional representations of the gauge group G that we have in mind. This observation, this, this kind of manipulation of Wilson lines, I should say, uh, it was something that in the case of zero cosmological constant was done many, many years ago, I think, by uh, Witten, and then it was studied in follow-up by Carlip. Uh, here, what we've done is basically understand this object in the case where the gauge groups are SL2 and, high, and generalizations of it. So the Wilson loop is basically the appropriate observable that is encoding the dynamics of a massive uh, point particle. It seems to be the natural replacement for the geodesic equation. Now, what are some features of this Wilson loop? So there's two basic features that are kind of interesting. If the connections just live inside the, the SL2 uh, group, Something that you can show very, very explicitly is that in the saddle point approximation of this path integral realization, uh, the, the value of the action is the geodesic length, and the strength is covered by the Casimir of the representation, which is basically the mass of the particle. Now, I'm emphasizing here in this drawing that uh, it doesn't matter really that the Wilson line followed a geodesic that's completely irrelevant. Uh, it's just important what the endpoints are. So the action does tell me what the geodesic length is, but the Wilson line is not necessarily following that path. Now, another computation that you can do is just compute it for a loop. So let's say that you have as a background uh, what you, we were calling a black hole-like connection, and you compute the Wilson loop along a closed spatial cycle. Uh, we showed that in that case, the, the log of the Wilson loop gives the thermal entropy of the black hole. So this, this loop is basically replacing as well the the size of the horizon, which also kind of makes sense. So our proposal then is to consider a Wilson line. So I'm not going to consider just curves that are close. I'm going to consider uh, lines. And we want to and give this object an interpretation in terms of the CFT. Now, I need to tell you uh, which, uh, which interpretation it has in the CFT depends on which representation you pick here. And so the easiest thing that you can do is say, well, let me pick a highest weight representation where the probe only carries a non-trivial quadratic Casimir. And so in this case, I interpret this as a particle that just has mass and it has no rotation and no higher spin charge. In that case, our proposal is that the log of this Wilson line in this representation will compute entanglement entropy in the CFT. You could as well uh, do other things, pick other representations. If the gauge group is bigger, there's other uh, rep uh, infinite dimensional representations that you could choose. And for instance, uh, Ihano and Krauss decided to study representations where you, the probe had as well a spin three charge. And so that means that you have a non-trivial cubic Casimir inside the representation. And 
it gives you a different observable in the CFT. The next step will be, well, I have a proposal. Can we prove it? So we set up uh, the stage to try to prove that. And the way that we tried to carry this computation was by understanding how to compute Reni entropies in Trans-Simons formulation. Then we showed how this computation of Reni entropies parallels a CFT computation of correlation functions. And uh, since we had so much free time, we also decided to study how that computation would be carried out if you did a TOTA theory uh, analysis. And I don't want to leave you holding, but you can guess what I'm going to say next. There was excellent agreement. So it works. <laughs> but let me uh, tell you a bit how the computation goes. Um, so we basically, uh, concretely what we did, we looked at four point functions and a large central charge limit. These four point functions are approximated. Ah, damn it. Okay, I think I sent the wrong slides because I just caught a typo. Um, so uh, we looked at this four point function and the large, uh, charge, <laughs> large central charge limit. Uh, we approximated it by the <laughs> vacuum block. And this, we showed that it was approximated by the Trans-Simons action on the appropriate uh, Riemann surface. Now, why do these two quantities agree? Well, there's actually a really good reason why they agree, and it's because basically the connection satisfies the same uh, monodromy problem as the ODE that this uh, correlation function satisfies. So you're guaranteed agreement on both sides. Now, um, similar statements have been showed uh, at this level in metric-like uh, formulation. It's just that in the metric-like formulation, you just need a little bit more work. In Trans-Simons, the agreement it becomes very quick, very immediate that uh, quantities are going to match. Now, in relationship to the Wilson line, what you can do further then is scale uh, appropriately two of the operators. So uh, two of them, I'll call them heavy. By heavy, I mean that they're conformal dimension divided by C is of order one, and two of the other operators, I'll make them small with respect to some parameter here, call it N minus one in relationship to the Reni entropies. And by explicit computation, uh, we showed that the vacuum conformal block is computed by this bulk Wilson line on the background of a connection that has higher spin fields turn on. So I should also emphasize here that these, uh, when we carry out these computations, both in the CFT and in the bulk, these operators don't just necessarily have some conformal dimension. They can also be charged under higher spin charges. So we showed it for basically any operator that you want to have here that has an appropriate scaling of its quantum numbers. OK, very good. So let's now start the part that might be a bit more controversial. So let's go back to this notion of black holes. Now, I told you. Everything that I've said so far revolve, uh, involves computing observables that are just at one boundary in ADS-CFT. Everything that I've said, computing charges, uh, doing thermodynamics, uh, this entanglement computation, everything is uh, just probing uh, things at one boundary of the space-time. But you could imagine <laughs> not having the Wilson line be glued at each, uh, be glued at the same point, like you can um, make one of their ends go loose. And the motivation to study this question is basically to ask, well, how does Trans-Simons theory know that an eternal black hole has two boundaries? Just the basic, that's, that's the basic question. Would Trans-Simons th theory tell me that an eternal black hole should be studied in this way? I don't know. And if yes, the question is, how would I know? What is, the, what is the way, how does Trans-Simon theory realize that I have access to another uh, boundary? And in terms of the Wilson line, I will be ambitious and try to like, compute a Wilson line that goes between these two boundaries. And what we think is that this object has that potential of telling us how to discover this other uh, boundary. Now, to do so, I need to have some input. So what we've uh, been unveiling is that I need to say a bit more about what I think an eternal black hole is. I need to give you some definition. And here's where maybe some of you might object or not. So the definition that I'm going to pose is that an eternal black hole is a thermal field double state in a CFT. So I'm going to use that as a working definition. We can discuss if it's an appropriate one or not. 
Now, it should be compared to the other definition that I gave you previously. So previously, I told you that Euclidean black holes satisfied a trivial holonomy condition along a thermal cycle. And you might think that these two conditions are just equivalent, that if I impose this condition, then the above will be automatic. And actually, it's not the case. So this one is compatible with the one below, but the one below is not compatible with the one above. So it's not trivial to say, what is the definition of a Laurentian black hole in this context? Now, I'm probably running out of time, but in any case, so our, our, our basic uh, aim is to say, OK, I have a thermal field double state in the, in the CFT. Uh, what should the Wilson line do such that it's compatible with the correlation functions that you will compute on this state? So you would inquire, OK, what will happen to correlation functions on one side versus correlation functions on, on the other side and as you cross through. Now, this is something that was studied previously in the literature, but it's a very difficult question because and not until very recently, it was hard to design uh, test particles in this theories and try to build a picture like this. So usually um, the computations relied going into the, the full Vassiliev theory and using the scalar inside the Vassiliev theory to probe this fixed fix. Uh, but now we, can, we don't have a necessity to study Vassiliev theory itself. We can use this Wilson line to probe this, uh, these quantities. And the, the way that we're trying to view this problem is like, let's say that you, usually in this, uh, in this context, when we write down connections, they're usually decomposed in this way where the radial dependence is separated from the boundary coordinate uh, dependence. And uh, another way you can phrase the problem is just by saying, OK, if I give you this connection, what will be the causal diagram that you will associate to it? And that really affects what this radial uh, function is over here. So the set of conditions that we're going to impose are basically we want to see a signal of a bifurcation point as we evaluate the Wilson line. Uh, we want to make uh, a condition such that we have a thermal field double interpretation is that left-left correlators have to be equal to right-right correlators. And as well, the one that is mostly uh, most constraining is that uh, as I go from left to right, I have to obey the appropriate KMS conditions. So, uh, yeah, very good. So I'm, uh, now I'm going to just finish. So my chairman is not complaining, which is great. Um, so to summarize, um, I hope I made for you the case that uh, by studying this higher spin theories, we're really unveiling new features and new challenges in quantum gravity. We really need to reconsider and rethink about uh, very basic uh, notions we had, but they're very much tied to metric-like uh, conceptions. So we're trying to move away from that uh, point of view. Uh, I told you how to replace and generalize the notion of distances by using this Wilson lines, and we made a plethora of checks in the CFT. And I think something that is very, that was always hiding in this checks and how agreement comes about is because of the relationship between this Chern Simons theory and, and Toda theory. And this is something that has appeared in many places in the literature. And I think it's a very interesting area of research to pursue. Now, uh, the two uh, subjects that we're aggressively pursuing right now is basically to give an interpretation to Laurentian solutions. So we've been very successful at characterizing Euclidean configurations, but I think now it's the time to really describe uh, Laurentian physics of these uh, black holes, and that's one of our aims. And the other one is uh, that we also want to consider other kinds of black holes, not just finite temperature black holes. So a lot of the Euclidean definitions assume that you have some finite temperature. So you could also ask, how would all of this be carried out if you have extremal solutions? What is the appropriate definition of an extremal black hole? What its characteristics and what are their BPS features? So with that, I finish and just thank you. So uh, you had the connection between the Wilson line observables and the entanglement entropy. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are two questions in that connection I have. One is that if I understood correctly, your Wilson loops were just straight lines between the two points. The they don't have to be straight lines. It doesn't matter By which shape. I meant the topological trivial. 
Yeah. Now, yes. what if you have tangled them up? So I'm not right. Uh, then I will have a, con a contamination from the thermal entropy of the system. So if I make it right, so if I make it wind through like a, a cycle that is non-trivial, no, then no, no, no. just just tangle with itself. I mean. Ah, tangle with itself. Um, yeah. So that would be like studying junctions of these. No, no. Junctions. My next question. <laughs> ah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, because junctions is also on a list of things to understand and to study. Uh, but if it, um, if it has, yeah, some kind of knot. Uh, so that's one of the interesting things about term science. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I would like to, in this context, the thing is that there's not, I have not studied it. So that's the short answer. Uh, I don't know what would happen in that case. And unfortunately, since I'm looking at non-compact gauge groups, there's very lit little literature beyond what we've done in this uh, in the subject. So I don't know what the interpretation is, but it's an interesting thing to but consider. The leading order in the That's also true. So I'm taking, but I, there still might be a, you might want to argue that those are suppressed, that if you, if you have these knots, that they, they're subleading, but it's something <coughs> just, I, okay. I think that that's what's going to happen, but I can't. The other question is related to junction, so that just, see. so if you have like three points, Mm -hmm. on the boundary, and then you can now connect them with the junction inside. What is the entanglement entropy of the interpretation in the boundary? Ah, okay. I was thinking of like having three join, uh, um, not one of the points at the boundary, but one of the points like in the interior of the, like have a Y shape. Yeah, no, that's Yeah, right. yeah, but, but okay, but you're putting the three. Yeah. Okay, so if you put the, if you put an additional point up there, so you're just inserting another operator in the CFT. So it, it will be a higher point correlation function. So the entanglement entropy have people studied of these three, three kind of junctions? Well, the thing is that if you have an odd number of twist fields, then no, it doesn't. three twists. Three Z, three twists. Ah, ah. Um, I'm not sure if that has been studied in the literature of entanglement entropy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the interpretation is in terms of a density matrix. But as a correlation function, it's, uh, yeah, that's, that's what this object will be computing. <laughs> I want to ask you about this Penrose diagram. So, did I understand correctly that uh, your distance function was purely Euclidean? Do you have a causal ordering in your distance function? In my distance function? I mean, you said you have a metric that comes out of looking at these Wilson lines, a distance function. Is it, is it a Lorentzian distance function? If you have a Lorentzian distance function, then you can... You it will be a Lorentzian. Sets. Yeah, yeah, it will be a Lorentzian distance function. But then you have a notion of causal sets. So, do these causal sets agree with the boundary notion of causal sets? Oh, that I don't know. So this is something that we're still currently investigating. So I don't know if it has a notion of causal sets with respect to the boundary. That's a good question. Yeah. Well, I, so I this is all very preliminary to. Well, this question is related to the one by Mukun. So the, I mean, the causal structure implies that you should have zero commutators between left and right. I mean, <coughs> using this Wilson line, is it easy to evaluate the commutators and decide where they are zero or non-zero? I think it should be doable, but we haven't looked at that. So, so far we're do doing even more rudimentary just check, but that's a good point. Yeah, you should see that, uh, yeah, that the commutator is, is zero. Uh, but I think that's something that we can, we can implement. Yeah, okay, very good. Excuse me, uh, there's ah. one question there. One difference that's been discussed recently in the literature is that the entanglement entropy can act as a precursor. So if you think of a state which is empty ADS for a while and then you act with a non-local operator to insert a scalar particle in the middle of ADS, uh, the Wilson line doesn't respond. It responds causally because it's, um, you know, it's, it's a massive, it's a probe of you know, some, some massive correlation function. Uh, but the entanglement entropy is believed to respond at least. Uh, so, so you know, the entanglement entropy can act as a precursor. It can reach out into the bulk and detect things which the Wilson line at least is believed not to do. I'm not sure if that's actually correct, but we can discuss that later. What you're Okay, uh, I mean this is something that was discussed in this paper by Jaffries and Sue recently, and uh, there's this old literature. Yeah, but this Wilson line, line really Giddings doesn't care about its, its shape itself, so its local properties. Uh, it's a flat connection, so I can, I'm freely to move the Wilson line wherever I want. I just care about where its endpoints are. So. But okay, uh, I'll be happy to, to discuss with you a bit more. Uh, you consider four-point function, uh, this too heavy operator and too light. Uh, yeah. Your too light is a scalar operator, so? 
Uh, no, they don't have to be necessarily light. So they can have also uh, higher spin charges, and then uh, they will be map. Yeah, they don't have to be. The chiral overtures, uh, I mean, then how will, how will the, in the both sides, how will it? Uh, it will change the representation of the Wilson line. So if the, if the twist fields only have mass, only have a conformal weight, then the representation uh, that you pick is one that only has a quadratic Casimir that is non-trivial. If the twist fields have uh, non other non-trivial higher spin charges, then I'm picking a representation where the Casimirs contain the information about those higher spin charges. That's so yeah, that's where the information is encoded. Um, yeah, it's, I wanted to make a comment, which I guess is related also to what Juan said, which is that, I mean, the, so you, you have to be a little careful about um, identifying um, correlation functions with the Wilson line in the same way that you have to be careful about identifying uh, correlation functions with geodesics. Um, I mean, in, in the bulk, there are different things. They're different operators, and they have different algebra. Uh, and so, 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 you know, you, you, uh... Yeah, I mean, they have to define more correctly with a conformal block in a certain limit. Uh, no, no, yeah, it's, it's identified, so I think what I'm computing in the CFT, uh, <coughs> like, yeah, um, it's, a, it's this correlation function in this very large central limit where you're taking two of the operators being very heavy versus two of them one being light, so... Yeah, but you, you mean it's computed by the expectation value of a bulk Wilson line in certain states, right? Yeah. Mm. So. Okay, <laughs> just one last question. <laughs> yeah, so. It, it, it's not a question, it's a comment. I, I just want to point out that entanglement entropy defined holographically does satisfy causality. It's not a precursor. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Alejandra?